specifically uh, directional tests. Direction, I-O-N-A-L, directional, I-O-N-A-L, tests, sometimes called one-tail tests. And I'm going to begin by contrasting the example we are going to do in a couple of minutes to the traditional example, the example we've been doing till now. In the case of the random number table, which I've been using as a paradigmatic example for teaching hypothesis testing, we have mu equal 4.5, h1 colon, not an equal sign, a lot of people put down an equal sign there, colon, mu not equal to 4.5. And let's think about this again from a fundamental point of view. Somebody claims the random number table is a good table. Somebody claims it's a bad table. So they decide to take some data from the table to see if the average is close to 4.5. If it's close to 4.5, they both agree we'll say we'll give the benefit of the doubt to the H0. If it's far from 4.5, we're going to say the H1 is true. Of course, the only question is how close does it have to be, and we've been developing formulas for that the whole, the whole chapter. But if it turns out that the average that you get from your sample is much bigger than 4.5, much, much bigger, does that prove it's a bad table? Yes. What if it's much smaller? Does that prove it's a bad table? Yes. I don't care if it's high or low. This is called a non-directional. And because it's non-directional test, when, we when it comes time to do the, either the Z calculation or the T calculation, depending upon if you have the, the, uh, the standard deviation of the sample, you're going to take the alpha and distribute it equally among the two sides. Either you're going to end up with a very positive Z-score. Okay, the formula for this is X bar minus mu over S over N. If the X bar is much bigger than mu, which means you're going to get a very positive T score, you're going to lead to rejecting a zero. If the X bar is much lower than 4.5, that will be a very negative Z score. That will also be reject a zero. And since we're trying to keep the chance of a type 1 error at exactly 5%, we have to chop the alpha in half. And of course, if you end up with an X bar close to 4.5, which means the difference is close to zero, then we do not reject a zero. It's perfectly logical. Now comes the example where we have to change this slightly, just very slightly, which I can teach the whole thing in two minutes. I'm going to read you a question from the book, which you'll probably see in the, in the online, I imagine. It says, the Glen Valley Steel Company manufactures steel bars. If the production process is working properly, it turns out steel bars that are normally distributed that's a, with a mean length of at least 2.8. Okay, at least 2.8, that's the key word here. Longer steel bars can be used or altered, but shorter bars must be scrapped. In other words, what's happening is if you, the machine, if, you know, the, the, the person who, who orders the bars on the, on the construction site is asking for bars that are 2.8 feet in length. If you send them a bar that's 2.9 feet, they just snip off a little piece. You know, they have a machine that snips it off and nobody cares. All you did is wasted a, little, you know, a couple of cents worth of steel. If it's too short, let's say it's 2.7 feet, if it's too short, you can't stretch it, it's just got to throw it away. So if the machinery is producing bars that are 2.8 or higher, everybody's happy. If it's lower than 2.8, everybody's unhappy. So you take a sample, and you, but you want to know, is the machine producing the right number of bars? So you take a sample of 25 bars, and it comes out to 2.73, which is slightly lower than 2.8, um, and a standard deviation of 0.20. Again, it's a sample standard deviation. And the question is, do you need to adjust the production equipment? They don't say, do you want to reject A0, accept A0? They're asking you a very English-type question. Do you need to adjust the production equipment? And the answer is going to be either yes or no. It needs to be adjusted. How do you solve the problem? Well, the first step, again, every hypothesis testing question involves four steps. It's going to be mu, some H1. Then it's going to be a calculation, which I can repeat over here, x bar minus mu over s over n. Then there's going to be a diagram of some kind. In this case, it's z or t, but we have to decide which is which. But for the test, it's always going to be it's going to be t, but for the spinner assignment, it could be z or t. And finally, you make your conclusion by indicating which region you ended up in and then interpreting that, that particular conclusion. So the, the, so the, the eight zero is going to be the same in every example. I erased it, but it's for the other ch chat. You know, the H1 is going to be the same. The colon is going to be the same. The mu is going to be the same. So before we start talking about the symbol, till now we had equal and not equal, the only symbols we saw so far. Because now that's going to change because we have a greater than or less than because we have a direction. But before, what's going to be the number here? What's going to be, so to speak, the status quo number, the number that we're trying to shoot against? 
What number would you plug in here? That was in the case of our good random number table, it's 4.5. What in this current example? What would be the, so to speak, the, the magic number, the number that? Yes, David. So the answer is 2.8, not the 2.73, the sample average. That would be that's the actual average. But the ideal number is 2.8. And the question is, are we better than that or worse than that? That's really the number. And again, I maybe at this point in the term, I should give up on trying to get people to put out their names, but I still would like people to put out their names, please, David. Thank you. Okay. So the only question is, what goes over here? Now, you might say, well, so far we learned equal and not equal. Well, I'll continue to put down equal and not equal, but that's not really realistic because if it turns out the X bar is much bigger than 2.8, that's fine. Remember, 8, 0 means everything's okay, status quo. No problem. This means the problem. The H1 is something new is happening, problem or something new, or there's got to be a change. So, well, how would you represent the fact that, the, uh, that everything is okay? If the average of the machine, meaning not, not just this 25 bars, but 25 million bars, all the bars that are made by the machine over the, you know, that particular production run, if it's greater than or equal to 2.8, it's equal is perfectly good, but if it's too big, nobody cares. But since the H1 is always the opposite of the A0, what has to be the symbol over here? Less than. Now, I'll tell you a very friendly uh, hint. Never put down the equal sign in the H1. It always goes into the A0. It's always going to look like this. Now, can you have the exact opposite? Less than or equal versus greater? Yeah, we'll see some other questions where you, know, we want, you would like it to be bigger than, you, know, you want it to be smaller, let's say, I don't know, the cost of something. You want it to be small. Anyway, the point is, this is called a directional test. It's called a one-tail test because when it comes time to make the picture, we're just going to be using one tail, not both tails. So we'll move on. To, we'll do that in a second. But what about step number two, which is you know always the calculation that stays exactly the same in this chapter in this section. The x bar is 2.73. The mu is the same mu that goes over here, 2.8. This s, I think I said, is 0.20 if I remember what I read. And the sample size was how much? Did I, 25, I think, right? So 5 into 20 is 0.04. 73 minus 28 is 0.07. 0.04 into 0.07 is minus 1.75. So please verify that, but I think this calculation comes out to minus 1.75. And you put that number aside for a second until you're ready to go to step number four. Now we go to step number three. Step number three is you got to decide to make the T diagram or the Z diagram. Of course, it's going to be the T because, first of all, that's only T, and the whole, whole test will only be T. Secondly, we're given the sample standard deviation, which was the real reason why we're going to the T. And you make your rejection regions. Now, last time we made them on both sides, but now we're not making them on both sides. We're making them on one side because if you're only as, the x bar is much bigger than 2.8, 2 you end up accepting the a0. If it's much lower than 2.8, you reject the a0. So the, any x bar lower than 2.8, which is a negative number, so the rejection region is only on one side, and this is the reject region. But everything else from here all the way to the end, it will now be do not reject a0. So that's the change of the picture of step number three. What about the change of the mathematics of step number three? With degrees of freedom is still going to be n minus one, which is 25 minus one or 24. By the way, I should, for the purpose of the videotape, I should write down this is worked example number 9.44. I don't know what it shows now. Worked. Introduction. And worked example 9.44. Did you say something? Find what? Oh, it's 9.44. Now, so now that you know what you know, what do you think the, the main mathematical step difference between step number three now compared to step number three over here? Laura? Yeah, we divide it because there were two of them. Now there's only one of them. We don't, so the alpha is not divided in half. So what's the alpha for this example? Let's see. Use a significance level of 0.05. So 0.05 does not get divided in half like it often did. And if you want to make a picture, 0.05 is the area of this piece over here. So now please go to the T table. Look up the 0.05 column where it meets row number 24. And what do you get? 